And God, we praise you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, with one final breath, it is finished. He vanquished the debt forever of all who come to you by grace through faith, of all who believe, regardless of their story, regardless of their life. Lord, you redeem sinners. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for saving me. I thank you, Father, for your hand of mercy, for your faithfulness, for the song you give in our hearts, for your indescribable gift in your Son. Lord, would you watch over me now as I attempt to preach your word? God, would you overshadow me? And in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that every person may be able to hear, so that I may be able to speak in a way that can be understood and followed. God, please help me. Please be with me. Please watch over everyone that hears. And this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The International Committee for the Red Cross has a list of practices regarding what is called customary international humanitarian law. And so there are all these rules listed that are considered like that customary that every nation has or should have, and they have different practices. And there's a practice relating to Rule 20, which is advance warning. There's a list of almost every nation in the world's self-expressed rules on the idea of advance warning in times of war. Almost every nation in the world. And all those nations have it written as law that every attempt will be made to warn a civilian population prior to any attack that could put them in harm's way. Unless, by the way, unless the element of surprise is necessary to the carrying out of the mission, then you're not obligated any longer. But as far as it's written, most nations have this law that they will do that. Uh, they will give advance warning to civilians if they can if there's going to be an invasion of some kind. And these opening pages of Luke's gospel, among other things, describe a merciful God's notice to the world that he is about to invade. He is about to invade planet Earth. And we could argue pretty convincingly, I think, that it makes sense if you're able to for a military to warn its own citizens or even other citizens of an attack so that if they can, they can take cover or get out of the blast zone or whatever. That seems to make sense, I think, for humanitarian law. But when God does this, God is putting his enemies on notice. When God puts his enemies on notice that he is sending his king to take over, and he isn't just going to look over them when it's all said and done, but give amnesty to them. He's announcing that he's going to invade, but he's announcing amnesty to them. When God does this, it's a mercy the world can't fathom. And the Holy Spirit's witness to the identity of Mary's baby caused Elizabeth to celebrate and Mary to express her joy over God's mercy with a song. In our text this morning, God's mercy on Mary is the beginning of his restoration of all things under the reign of his son. And so we come back to the first chapter in Luke and we begin at verse 39. We're going to read through and then we'll have three things that we'll talk about when we're done. Verse 39, in those days, remember the days of what is happening to her that the angel has announced that she's going to give birth and his name will be called Jesus. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. As soon as Mary hears from the angel that her formerly barren relative Elizabeth is with child, she rushes to see her. The hill country it's talking about most likely refers to that area around Jerusalem. It's Mary who probably ends uh, Elizabeth's seclusion, if you remember. Remember when she found out she was pregnant, she secluded herself for five months. She just stayed alone and rejoiced and thanked God. And it's Mary that probably ends that and is the first to see her. If Zechariah was mute, which he was when she got there, Elizabeth may not have known, she may not have known, although Zechariah could have written it down and told her, but she may not have known that her child, the child in Elizabeth, was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, which, by the way, is going to explain the next part 
of the story in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped for joy inside me. Because it's just a fetus. The baby leaped for joy inside me. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he has spoken to her. So at the sound of Mary's voice, the baby inside Elizabeth, tiny little John the Baptist, leaps for joy. That's how Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, interpreted her baby's kick or movement in that moment. God reveals to her that Mary is carrying her Lord. Now, this is the first time in the narrative that the word Lord is used to refer to Jesus. 23 other times in this first part of the story, when that term is used, it refers to the God of Israel. Here, for the first time, it refers to to Jesus. And she prophesies, Elizabeth does, blessed are you among women and your child will be blessed. Now think about this. Elizabeth has no idea that Mary is pregnant. All she's done is presumably greet her by yelling out, Elizabeth, right? So she doesn't have any news. They didn't have email. They didn't have phone. They didn't have text. She had no idea. Mary wasn't showing by this time. This is happening shortly after the announcement. So There's no way that Elizabeth has of knowing that she's pregnant. She knows because the Holy Spirit that fills her in this moment reveals that to her. And it's beautiful. Elizabeth isn't jealous that her son will be subordinate to Mary since he is the Lord. You don't get any bitterness from her. Well, I'm finally pregnant. But of course, Mary has to have the Messiah in her womb. There's none of that, right? She rejoices. She realizes that God's salvation is going to be carried out through the baby her relative is carrying. Elizabeth is humbled in this moment. Not only is she carrying a child who will be great, the prophet of the Most High, but Elizabeth is standing in front of the mother of the Most High himself. And she asks, how can this be? Look at how God is blessing my family and reversing our fortunes. How can this be? Mary is blessed by Elizabeth because she believed that the Lord would fulfill what was spoken to her, unlike her husband. Remember back in chapter 1, verse 20, Zechariah doesn't believe that the word of the Lord will be fulfilled. He doubts it. And so when Elizabeth says that, I I doubt this happened, but you could almost see her saying, looking over at Zechariah, blessed is the one who believed that the Lord would fulfill what he spoke to her. So... (laughs) Elizabeth has an expectant heart because God is doing great things in her days, and she's there to see it. Elizabeth has, or Zechariah is mute. The father of John the Baptist is mute because he didn't believe that the word of the Lord would be fulfilled, and Elizabeth is probably so thankful in verse 45 because she is realizing even more that God is up to something. Something is happening. God, who for all intents and purposes through the prophets his normal spokesman, has been silent for 400 years, is now moving once again. And she sees it, and she's thankful that her family is caught up in it. Mary didn't miss it. Mary chose to be a part of it. She believed in it, and she's excited for her. And so, beloved, the Holy Spirit of God, from the very beginning, witnesses to the deity and the glory of Jesus in John the Baptist while he is is still in the womb. And we begin to see in Luke just precisely what it is then when we think about the Holy Spirit, what it is that the Holy Spirit does. He glorifies Jesus. That's his task. Jesus himself said this in John 16, verse 4. He will glorify, speaking of the Spirit, he will glorify me. He witnesses to the fact that Jesus is true. He confirms Jesus' identity. He makes him known. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He illuminates Jesus. Sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as just this impersonal kind of force that shows up if we happen to get really serious while we're singing or something like that. But this is not who he is. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead, the God who is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And his primary task is to glorify and to reveal Jesus to human hearts. And so when the Holy Spirit is truly present, Jesus is being exalted. Jesus will be 
seen more clearly. Jesus will be glorified. Jesus will be heard. The Holy Spirit is centered on Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And before Mary even speaks, he reveals her baby's identity to his prophet while he's still in the womb. And as a result of all this joy, Mary then does what Hannah, Samuel's mother, also barren back in 1 Samuel 2, had done. I, I, if I were you, I would go read that sometime and see in 1 Samuel 2 the beautiful similarities between Hannah's song and Mary's song here in Luke. But that's what Mary does. She breaks out into what is a psalm, a song. And so the revelation of Jesus is clothed by the Holy Spirit in the worship of God. And you see the Trinity, you see the Godhead in this text together for the sake of Christ. The revelation of Jesus is clothed by the Holy Spirit and results in the worship of God. Verse 46, And Mary said, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because He has looked with favor on the humble condition of His servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed because the Mighty One has done great things for me and His name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear Him. He has done a mighty deed with His arm. He has scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He has toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering His mercy to Abraham and His descendants forever, just as He spoke to our ancestors. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. This is the Magnificat, the Latin word for the first line in Mary's song. In other translations, it says, My soul magnifies the Lord. It's worth noticing that Luke placed a psalm right in the middle of this historical narrative, which means this, it's not just meant to be read. This is poetic. Songs are not just meant to be observed. Songs are meant to feel, to internalize. We're encouraged to claim this text as our own then, to sing the song along with Mary. So the gospel we're reading here is a lot more than just history, although it is that. It's to be internalized and to become a part of us become real in us. Mary is interpreting God's favor, His undeserved favor on her as a representative of God's acts of salvation from Abraham forward. What He is doing in her is that. This is who God has always been. This is what God has always been doing. She can't help but fall down and worship then. She knows that nothing in her caused God to bless her in this way, which is why Mary says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary needed a Savior. She's praising God for mercy on her, for saving her. Mary is a remarkable, amazing woman of God, but she was not immaculate. She wasn't perfect. She wasn't holy. She calls God her Savior because she needed one. She was a sinner. That's the whole point of her psalm here. God has showed mercy to me. She's rejoicing for it. If it's expected, nobody's singing. Again, you don't sing when you get your paycheck. You sing if you don't. Because you worked. You earned that money. Paychecks aren't anything to get excited about unless you don't get it. You don't walk into your boss's office and say, look, man, lady, I just want to thank you for my paycheck. It means so much to me. Thank you so much. No, no, no. I, I worked. Pay me. Right? You don't sing. Right? She's singing because this is completely undeserved. It's complete undeserved favor. She realizes she's carrying a child that will cause all future generations of humanity to recognize that she has been uniquely blessed by the mighty God. The holy God has blessed her. You see that? And his name is holy, she says. The holy God has blessed me. Mary is interpreting all of this as an act of mercy on God's part, which is always on those who fear Him. Which means God shows mercy to those who respond to Him with reverential awe. This isn't fear like you'd be afraid of a, a shark or a lion or something. This is reverential awe. His mercy is on those who fear Him in this way. God's arm, she says, His works in humanity. That's a term for that. What God is doing in humanity, His arm has performed this great deed in her. 
the fact that he has done this mighty work in this way with his humble servant Mary realizes that means he's turned away from the proud because in their hearts they don't revere God. They don't have a reverential awe for God. Not the proud. He's turned them away. This action means that the mighty and the powerful have been undone and the lowly have been exalted. God has satisfied the hungry, the rich, that is the full, the self-reliant in their hearts. He's turned away empty. They've been sent away. They've been rejected. In fact, Mary realizes that this move of God's arm means he is acting decisively to fulfill the merciful promise that was given to Abraham and then passed on to all of Abraham's descendants, which as Scripture moves on and we get into Galatians, we understand what Mary is saying here. God's mercy is for Abraham and all of his descendants, that is, those who have faith. Galatians 3, 7. So not only is God the Redeemer and Deliverer of Israel, He is more than that. Mary's song is for every believer. It's for all those who have faith. Those are Abraham's true descendants. And it remains true. Her song remains true then for all who have faith throughout the course of human history, including us this morning. So this text, for those of us that have faith or will desire to have faith, this text is for us. This song is ours just as it was Mary's. This is what God is doing now then, even in our day. And he continues to do through Christ. But that leads us to ask then, what precisely is God doing? What do we mean when we say God is up to something? God is doing something. What does the song say? The coming of this child, Mary's baby, who will be called Jesus. What does this song say that means for the world? This song is how Mary interpreted what God was doing. That's interesting. The angel in the story, Gabriel, only announced what God was doing. The interpretation of what God is doing comes through the human women in the story, telling us what these things mean. And the coming of Jesus into the world then means at least three things in Mary's song. Each one reveals the God who sent Jesus to us. And if we take Jesus at his word, that knowing God and his son is eternal life, Nothing could have more importance in our lives now or for this world than the truth about who God is for us in Jesus. And so the coming of this child into the world first means God desires to save. God desires to save. Our God is a saving God. Mary's song is a proclamation that God will save and he will save the weak and the bankrupt. When she brings up Abraham, when Mary brings up Abraham, her mind is making this connection, right? The man of faith and all his descendants. She is revealing then that God will only ever accept those that have faith in him. Why? Faith is an admission that we have nothing whatsoever to offer God. That's what faith is. It casts all our hope on him to save us. It claims nothing of its own. It makes no demands. It offers no payment. Faith brings nothing to the table and says to God, because of this, you should accept me. That's what the powerful in the world, the rich materially or in heart would tend to do, is to bring to God all the reasons God should accept them. So you could be very poor and still have a rich heart. And she is saying through this song, God, you save only those who bring nothing, who have nothing to offer you, and know they have nothing to offer you. That's faith. To step outside of ourselves and say, you have to save me. I have nothing. I am poor. I am hungry. I am empty. Save me, please. I believe that you can. This song reveals now in the fullest and most complete way what God has been revealing about himself all through human history. God looks with favor on the empty, the humble, those who fear him, the lowly, the hungry, not because they're like that. That's very important. God does not show partiality. So it's not like God has a soft spot for this group and loathes this group. It doesn't work that way. God isn't making calls based on what we have in us. In that case, it would be meritorious to be poor. So the way to get to God would be to sell everything you have and make yourself materially poor. 
That's not the point of what he's after here. He's talking about the poor in heart. Low and hungry inside. It's that God saves those who by grace through faith recognize who they are in light of who he is. God does not save those who think they have something to give him or something that he should recognize. The amazing thing is not that God saves the poor. The amazing thing, given the fact that we are rebels and sinners all, is that he saves any of us. That's the amazing thing. That's the whole point that he's trying to make here. The biggest enemy of your fellowship with the one who made you is you. When there is separation between us and God, it's because we can't get out of our own way. Which means very beautifully in this psalm that in spite of our inability, in spite of the impossibility that we could ever pay him enough or do enough good or be poor enough or shun enough bad to earn his salvation, even though we are filled with rebellious and sinful hearts against everything God requires of us, he comes to us anyway. That's the amazing thing she's so thankful for here, that he comes to us anyway. The king is not obligated to show mercy to the opposing side when he takes over. But that is precisely what God has done in Christ. Rather than coming with a sword this first time to wipe out all of his enemies, which would mean the only person on earth would be Jesus, he comes to show mercy. Salvation, beloved, has to be also seen as amnesty because the king is going one day to destroy all his enemies. His first move, though, is all mercy. God desires to save. It's his heart. It's what he wants to do. God doesn't do anything he doesn't want to do. And secondly, God intends to reign. God desires to save. God intends to reign. There's something else that Mary is passionate to make clear. The coming of Jesus is also God's invasion of the kingdoms of this world with his own king. Jesus Christ here is the Lord. He's the king of all the earth. This is the king that God has set on Zion, his holy hill. All riches, all authority, all power, all social divisions as the means by which someone is made favorable to God are being decisively rejected by God. I will not accept anything you are or anything you have to give me if I am going to give you amnesty. That's what he's saying in Christ. I am not interested in anything you have to give. You see how in that way he lays out the rich in heart, the full, the proud, those that think they have something to offer him. Jesus is making a claim here. The coming of Jesus is God's declaration that he will not be bought or bribed or impressed with anything humanity has to offer him, which means he has leveled once and for all the playing field. His mercy will fall exclusively on those who realize they need it as they will be welcomed into this new world order where the king is Jesus. So this song is very much a song of restoration where God pronounces through Mary that Jesus has not only come to save, but to reign, to put all things under his order, back where he intended them to be when he created us. God will not strive with humanity forever. The king is bringing a new order. There was an article I read in the cauldron, just different articles. It was called An Honest Coach Introduction Speech. And the context was college football. And the author was lamenting how um, canned and, um, I guess, dishonest a new coach's speech is in that first press conference when he takes over a new team. You, know, you, you, can, even, you can script it ahead of time. You know precisely what they're going to say. Every time they take a new job, the, uh, they say certain things. It's what they're supposed to say. They have to say. And he's lamenting that and, and, and wishing that there could be an honest coach introduction speech 
And then he imagines what it would sound like, and it would sound something like this. And then one part of it, he said this, uh, because most coaches talk about the rich tradition of the school they're coming to, the amazing job they plan on doing at recruiting and how they're going to begin doing things the right way and all that. And what if they were just honest? And part of it, he wrote this. This is the coach talking in his imaginary speech. I'd love to tell you that I'm going to, I'm going to recruit players who comport themselves with honor and dignity and want to get an education. I know that's a little dance we're all supposed to do to pretend we all care about those things. I also know that if I recruit a team full of missionaries with 4.0s but don't put up 10 win seasons, I'll be out on my behind in no time, so let's just forget that. I'm going to recruit kids I think will be really good at football. If they happen to not be felons, we'll consider that a bonus. <laughs> but they don't say that. They never say that. They can't say that. We know it's baloney when we hear things. We, we know we're being lied to, but we want to hear it. It's what you're supposed to say. New coaches say everything they're supposed to say at their first press conference, all the while knowing the most important thing to do is to win at almost any cost. I think it would, some, for some reason, like we act like we don't know what's going on, but it would probably devastate us if we knew you know, all the ways that they get players and keep players and things like that. It would just be too much for us. We don't want to know who we really are and what we really love and how we don't actually care about the honorable things. We want to win. It's what we want from our teams. When God sent his king, he pulled zero punches. He hid nothing. He didn't change his words or mess with it so that it sounded the way we want it to sound. He was 100% clear on what the coming of this king meant, what he would be like, what he would do, and who he would favor. And God is telling us here in no uncertain terms that he's going to rule the world with this king and he's going to rule the world like this. And he tells us, the lowly and the hungry, they will have God's favor. Not the wealthy, not the powerful, not the heavy hitters. God is going to scatter them in the futility of their own self-congratulating imaginations. And this is him coming to set the world right. And that means undoing the current way of things, the fallen humanity way of doing things. Jesus came to overthrow the world. He came to destabilize it. He came to take what is normal and make it abnormal. He'll send the rich away empty. The rich don't get sent away. The rich can get whatever they want by buying it. God sends the rich away empty. No, I, 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 I'll take your money. I don't need it, but I'm going to send you away empty. It's mine. I own it. I own you. He will reject everyone who refuses to realize they need him. And that mindset, that view of the world will characterize Jesus' whole ministry in Luke as Jesus himself proclaims that he has come with good news for the poor. And the implication is that he has come with bad news for the rich and the powerful in their hearts. All these upside-down values in Mary's song prepare us for Jesus to challenge the status quo over and over again in his ministry. That's what Luke is. His kind and tender heart for the broken, for the sinful. His relentless desire to be close to and love and serve those that the righteous and rich and powerful had no time for and disdain will mark the ministry of Jesus. Be careful what kind of person you are trying to become. That's why the fact that this is a psalm, a song is so important. All through the psalms, that book in the Old Testament, the servants of God, the meek, the poor, the downtrodden, again and again they feel downtrodden, overlooked, exploited over and over again by the ungodly who always seem to have everything going for them. That was the source of so much sorrow and lament in the Psalms. God, I'm your servant and I have nothing. I'm depressed. I'm broken. I'm lonely. I'm attacked all the time. And your enemies, those that loathe you, they have everything. They're always rich, always in control. Don't you hear me? Won't you come and help me? And all through the Psalms, it was the meek and the poor, though, who put their trust in God, who always, one way or another, 
vindicated them. And now Jesus is bringing that order into the whole world. The reign of Jesus is good news for the poor. It's good news for those that can't clean themselves up enough to look worthy. That's who Jesus is good news for. You see, this isn't blowing you away if you think you don't need him. You think, okay, that's who he's for. I'm not like that. Right, you don't see him. There's a reason it doesn't sound like good news. You're full of yourself. For those that can't buy their way out of difficult situations, that's who Jesus came for. For those that have no delusions that God would think highly of them. You see, Jesus will reign over a people that he isn't ashamed of, but most of us would be. But just so we don't take this in the wrong direction now, because you can, and it has been, that there's a a movement called liberation theology that uses this as one of their central texts to justify their actions in the world. Mary has God, though, as the subject of all the verbs in her song. Not us. God. So this is not a revolutionary call to human beings to take action and change the world into God's kingdom. That's not what this is. This is a celebration of God's action to change the world into his kingdom. And he does that not by power, not by force, but by mercy and love. By a man dying for his enemies. That's how God accomplishes his reign in the world. God won't do this by putting different sinners in the places of power than the ones that are currently in them. This isn't a warrant then for any kind of economic or political upheaval or violence or force. God isn't kicking out one set of rogues to bring in a new set of rogues. That's not how Christians spread the gospel of the kingdom. That's not how Christians spread the gospel of the kingdom. It is not by power and authority and political influence. That's not the way God moves. So it's not like God replaces When we read this text, it's not like an excuse to to get our own agenda put forward. You know, he replaces patriarchy, men ruling everything, and now because they were they were oppressed, now women will run everything. Yes, that's that's the way to see this text. No, that's not what he's doing. Through Jesus Christ, he is going to transform sinners into people that love their neighbors and serve them. That's how he will reign in his first coming. So the followers of Jesus, for God to make this happen in the world, to bring this kingdom into the world, his followers are not given actual political power and material prosperity to force the world into becoming Christian. Guys, that's what Islam does. That's what Islam is doing as we speak, to take over the world by terror and by force by getting into the places of authority and power and influence. Because it's a false system, it can only use the tools of the world to get its way. We are not like that. And we have to die to that. We don't become powerful by getting in places of authority. We don't force the world to become Christian. We don't force other people to behave the way we want them to behave. That's oppression, beloved. Jesus didn't do that. His followers must not do that. His reign means there will be a new scale of values and the old social divisions and the way we determine value are no longer going to matter. Remember, in this kingdom, the first will be last and the last will be first. It's the whole tone of the kingdom. I mean, this is is pretty fiery stuff. Rulers tossed from thrones, the proud humbled, the rich made bankrupt, the lowly exalted, the hungry fed. Because Christians get to run the governments? No. Because salvation has come. God will create a new kind of humanity that doesn't need power or money to maintain the kingdom they serve. This is not just a baby to be be adored then. This is the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And these are rocks in a pond, beloved. Her song 
is pebbles in a pond that will ripple out into the world of the comfortable and the self-assured and the lovers of themselves as it undoes injustice and hate. So as we look around the world that we're in, we have to see there's a reason. There's a very clear reason for the insanity and the selfishness and the hopelessness and the defiling of God in the world. There's a reason for all this. God has scattered them. He's actively against them and rejecting them. He subjected the world to futility. That, that's, the world is responding in futility. That's why it's so irrational and insane and wicked in so many different ways and places because God runs the world and they don't want him to, but they can't do anything about it. The source of all murder and covetousness and terrorism, all of it. I want the world I want, but I can't get it. You ever held a little boy back? I'm thinking of a little boy because I don't know if I want to admit this, but I do this to Carmine, where you hold the kid back by his forehead and he tries to kick you and punch you, and it's it's just pitiful. You know, I mean, my arms are too long, he can't, and he just wails in the air until finally he just gives up and quits. Right? That, that's, that's what the world is doing, in essence. Right? I mean, God is not so cold as the, to do this, but that's what the world is doing. It's just kicking and flailing. That's the source of all suffering. All sin, all violence, all hatred, all brokenness is this world's futility to rebel against its king. And God has sent Jesus to say, now it's my turn to run the world. Make peace with me through my son or be condemned. And the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham means the reversal of the curse to which the world is enslaved. Now every family will be blessed through Jesus Christ. Salvation brings a new order. Mary is the voice of the marginalized, challenging those on high in this world in what they think are their immovable seats of power. God intends to reign. And the coming of this baby, regardless of what kind of king the world wants, is God's proclamation that he will reign through his son and nobody else will. Which means, finally and thirdly, God desires to save, God intends to reign, and God reveals our hearts. The reign of God in Christ reveals our hearts. God's saving actions we see here also include his reigning actions in Christ. Jesus then reveals our hearts. He's, God reveals through Jesus what it is that we actually value and desire because he's in charge of everything and he controls everything. When he puts the world on blast and says, in effect, that he will only save those who relinquish all claims on themselves and cry out to him for mercy, that's what he's doing. He's, that is going to reveal the actual state of our heart and what we really think of him. He means to rule the world with a new order where a people who have denied themselves that they may love and serve others no matter the cost. If that's the case, what we really think of ourselves what we really love and what we really want are going to start to come out because this kingdom is going to bump up against the kingdoms we are trying to build every day. Every day. You see, the reign of Jesus, the saving reign of Jesus lays claim to you and your whole life. He lays claim to our time. which we never seem to have. He lays claim to our money. He lays claim to the role we have in our marriage. He lays claim to the role we have in our church. We're always trying to mess with it and switch it around so that we can actually get our way. And we sanitize it so that we can feel comfortable with what we're doing when we're actually just rebelling. I am flat out amazed at the means and ways my precious, beautiful little kids come up with not telling the truth. It's amazing. I love you guys to death, but it's amazing. 
Every time, I, I don't, you shouldn't always use your family, like that's preaching 101. But it's Carmine, every time you tell him, I told you no, he says, I forgot. Every time. Every, it doesn't matter what you could have just said, don't touch that thing. I forgot. Every time. Th th that's human nature. We don't teach that. Where do they get it? We, nobody teaches that. Listen, you've got to play some games here with us if you want to get your way. Nobody teaches that. That's human nature. Like there's not a king. There's a king. Our roles in our churches, God lays claim to that in Christ. Our parenting, our employment, our attitude towards our enemies, our belief about power and control, Jesus Christ lays claim to all of it. So now, beloved, that means we think about this revealing our hearts. How does the reign of big King Jesus reveal my little heart? All selfishness. All pride, all demanding, all attempts to control are a rejection of the rule of King Jesus at a personal level. You will not run my life. Jesus didn't come only to make us whole, but to rule over us because he saved us. And only under his rule is there life and peace. We don't think that. We are terrified of authority most of the time for good reason because human authority almost always goes bad. That's why we have sayings like absolute power corrupts absolutely. No human being is capable of being the king because we're all nasty inside. Christ is not and he reigns over the world. Only under his rule is there life and peace, but those things are achieved his way, not ours. And so instead of submitting to the way and the will of Jesus in our lives to end with life and peace and hope and joy, we hijack the kingdom and try to make life and peace and hope and joy for ourselves by doing things our own way and getting the things we want our own way and justifying what we do because it's what we want. And all the while, that is a rejection of the kingship of the Lord. And what you're doing is just futilely kicking and swinging at him as though you're going to reign because that's what you want. God will accomplish this upheaval through the death of his son, not through political ascension. And there's something for us to behold in that, beloved. We need to rethink power and control and need and want through the lens of Jesus and how it is that God chose to bring his reign and what it means then to be his offspring. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it this time. So what is the normal posture of your heart towards others? Are they there for you to love and serve? Or are they means of building your kingdom? And so if they get in your way, there's conflict at the marriage level, the interpersonal level, the friends in schools. That's, that's, that's what we do. The reign of Jesus lays claim to all the outworkings of our lives and our hearts. So in every single area of our lives, we are either rejecting his rule or submitting to his rule in the way we treat others because that's the sphere of where this is going to be lived out. Are we looking to bring the love and life of Christ into our world, into our own lives, or to force our way by power or control or money or manipulation or guilt or threat Jesus laid down his life. And if we say, well, see, the reason Jesus was the way that he was about authority, the reason he said things like, you know, render to Caesar what is Caesar, the reason Jesus was like that is because him and the apostles didn't live in a democracy, so they couldn't vote. So that was just the way they had to deal with it. He's Jesus. If he wants to kick out Caesar, he can do it, right? If he wanted to undo the current political system he lived in for a better one, he could do it. He didn't. He had all the power. He used it 
to be a force of love and mercy. Jesus reveals our hearts then. The reign of God coming into the world to flip everything upside down or right side up was accomplished with mercy. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to even judge the very thoughts and intentions of the heart, and the word of God is named Jesus. When we're angry, beloved, when we're worried and impatient and demanding and selfish, what we are doing in that moment is looking at the king and saying, you are not doing a good job running the world. Give it to me. Let me run my life. I can avoid this if you let me do this my way. And our whole lives are that, beloved, pushing against the reign of one who died for us. When you hear this, I was thinking as like I didn't, the, the sermon ends in just like a paragraph or so. And I thought I, I didn't want to end, I was thinking this last night and this morning, I don't want to end with that weight of, oh my gosh, I rebel against Jesus all the time. Yes! So what do we take from that? What's the takeaway? We need mercy, beloved. We need the gospel. This mercy is the only hope we have. We're going to be fighting like this until we die. We're going to continue to try to run the world ourselves and control our little world and make it into what we want to be. We're going to need a Savior 400 years from now if that's how long we live. We need a Savior and we have one. That's the whole point. When you hear that the rich are being sent away empty and God is exalting the lowly, God is telling you, get low. Need Him. Don't get to a place where you're like, sweet, I, I run this thing. I do A, B, C, and D. I got my life on lock. I'm, I'm doing really well. Don't get there. It doesn't mean you're going to be irresponsible and goofy. It means you're going to need Jesus. He'll put your life together. Trust him. We need mercy. We need the gospel all the time, every single one of us. Mary's words challenge all of us to look at how we see our lives, how we view social life and political life and single life and married life and school life and church life. And if we're not careful, the way we live those things can be an outright rejection of God's values and God's kingdom. But Christ has come to serve us in mercy. Accept it. Accept it. The worst thing you can do is be so fake humble to say, nobody's going to buy my dinner for me. That's not humility, that's pride. Let Jesus buy it and let Jesus leave the tip. Your heart is laid bare before Jesus and so is mine. Every single person in this room this morning in one way or another is rejecting the rule of Jesus. The only hope we have this morning is not to commit to being better people and rededicate our lives, which always seems to need to happen again and again and again and again and again. I rededicated my life to the Lord again is the way we should say that. Don't do that because you're trusting in your dedication and your will to save you and it can't and it won't. Trust the mercy of one like this. Trust him. Nobody can hide. Pledge allegiance to the merciful son and let yourself go. That's who his salvation is for. So I pray this morning that the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit that happened and Elizabeth will happen in us right now. It's the only way we can see, that's the only way we can know how needful we really are is if the Holy Spirit awakens us to see it. And so I pray that's happening all over this room this morning. Ushers, I'm going to ask you to come while we do this last song and the band comes, we'll take our offering together. But I'd ask all of you to throw yourselves at the feet of Jesus this morning and receive him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time you've given to us, and we thank you for your word, for your Son, Jesus Christ. And now, Father, would your Spirit come and bear witness with our spirits that he is the truth. I ask this in his name. Amen.